Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Udang Saranga Chami Damang Saranga Chami Sanang Saranga Chami Dutyanti Udang Saranga Chami Dutyanti Tamam Saranga Chami Dutyanti Sanam Saranga Chami Tatyanti Uram Saranga Chami Tatyanti Tamam Saranga Chami Tatyanti Sanam Saranga Chami This completes the going to the three references. Anyatipada Varamani Sakapadam Samadhi Ami I undertake the precepts to refrain from harming or destroying living beings. Adina dana Ramani Sakapadam Samadhi Ami I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kamesu Michachara Ramani Sakapadam Samadhi Ami I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musa Vada Varamani Sakapadam Samadhi Ami I undertake the precept to refrain from wrong speech. Sura Mareya Maja Padatana Varamani Sakapadam Samadhi Ami I undertake the precept to refrain from intoxicants that cause terror. I undertake the precept to refrain from sources of livelihood that bring harm to other beings. I undertake the precept to refrain from acting out of ill will or taking satisfaction in the misfortune of others. I undertake the precept to be open-hearted and generous in all my relationships with others. I undertake the precept to practice loving kindness and compassion in all my relationships with others. I undertake the precept to live with mindfulness and follow the Eightfold Path through daily study, meditation, and reflection. With these ten precepts, virtue becomes the vehicle for a happy existence. Through virtue, good fortune is attained. Virtue is the vehicle for liberation. Let us purify our virtue. This completes the ten precepts. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be free from ill will. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings make themselves truly happy. Thank you very much and good evening. So, there's so many things that I could talk about. You'll have to help me decide which one. So, perhaps you've had some Dharma question that you've really been puzzling about. Perhaps.
perhaps not. Related question. I start to have a whole body pain. Yeah. It's getting serious. Knee pain, back pain. You started to have pain all over your body. I mean, back, knee. Mm-hmm. Uh, because a couple of days passed, uh, do intensive meditation, mm-hmm. and the physical started to react. Almost everybody. <laughs> Is there? Are you doing anything different in the way that you sit? No, because at home, the most I do is three hours, three times a day. Here, it's almost all day long. Yeah. And is that the same for you, that it's just the longer sitting? That is? Yeah, yeah, longer yeah. sitting, yes. On the bad bone, is getting better. At the same time, it's getting pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> I can also pour that <laughs> Neck, anybody? Shoulder? Back? A bit tension yeah. after a while. <laughs> She's young. <laughs> Flexible. <laughs> well, this is one of the things that uh, does that does happen. Um, and, and as always, I, I say, you know, if, if there is any, if there is any simple way to make a physical adjustment, you know, do so. But don't don't waste a lot of time uh, just constantly trying to change the way you sit, because uh, when you sit for long periods of time, pain does develop. Now, what you may find hard to believe, but a certain, a certain degree of this pain is not actually physical. It's really coming from... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a direct result of the meditation. It's part of just the way that our minds tend to resist this activity uh, of sitting still and uh, practicing meditation for long periods of time. And it will pass away. Uh, you've done long retreats before, right? Yes, I did. Same thing? Um, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. after three or four days, uh, the, the pain is so unbearable, but uh, after four to five days, kind mm-hmm. of... Uh, yes, uh, it gets better. Yeah. 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 So, yes? Uh, I was just wondering if, uh, because since we aren't doing uh, Qigong anymore, uh, if anybody happens to know yoga or any yeah. other physical activity, so we get, we, I personally don't, but if there is anybody, it might be helpful for us all to engage in it. This would be a, yeah, a very, very good idea. And uh, ideally, there should be a, a period of exercise every day. And we're, we were so lucky to have uh, a, a Qigong leader, and so unfortunate that he couldn't. Continue. So, yeah. Uh, if we were to do yoga, uh, preferably we'll be indoors. I mean, we need yeah. to move the place back. Yeah, yeah. Yo- yo- yoga is. Yeah. It would have to be in here, and you have to move things around. Right, and then if we go occupy the same time as the shikam, then you won't disturb anybody mm-hmm. else's meditation. Yes, that would be the right time to do it. Right, and. Uh, what if people want to do the meditation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Her experience is that you just attend many, many retreats and it was, the pain will stop. Well, that's right. And the pain is, <laughs> that's true, the pain will stop. And uh, probably within another day or two, most of you will find it much easier to sit. But the exercise, uh, the exercise will be helpful, and it is a good idea. And I don't know if there's anyone here. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will discuss with someone and try to see if I can arrange. If I can arrange, I will uh, announce. Is that okay. okay. All right, that would be good. Okay. You know, even somebody who would lead everyone in the Qigong warm-up exercises, or uh, you know, that would that would be enough to make a huge difference. You know, so. 
Okay. So everybody well. prefer to do yoga or qigong? Uh, oh. Yoga. But it's different, I guess. We could do both, you know. So to have, <laughs> to have one group do yoga and the other group stand outside and do some, some kind of qigong. So that's mm-hmm. fine. I, I wrote notes from Russell's um, qigong so that I would have them for myself. <laughs> so I actually wrote down what we were doing. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to lead anybody doing yoga, but um, if I could do yoga here during the same time as Qigong, uh, anybody who's interested could just... Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. I wouldn't leave that because what if, well, personally, I would prefer to have the place to meditate. Um, but if I'm the only one, then it's okay. Oh, is there... Have you been meditating in here before the uh, right. uh, during the meal break? I think that takes priority. Yeah. Um, we're talking oh. about at nine thirty, which is when we were. That's what we were talking about. She says she. Oh, that's the break. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's someplace else that we could do yoga that it could be. Uh, of course, we have beds everywhere, don't we? She <laughs> offers a lot of same benefits without okay. taking a I, lot of room. What's that? Hey, and uh, a question, uh, sorry, suggestion. She said I can do meditation in one room, so. It's if okay. she's the only one who can do yoga, we can do yoga here. She can do meditation at our room. And when you've been in here in the morning, have you been the only one usually? Uh, I think sometimes you are here, but no. Yeah. It's only recently because now breakfast, the duty is lower. Somebody is washing the dish for me, so I can. Mm-hmm. But this morning, I was the only one. Okay. Is there anyone else that uh, likes to meditate in here before 10 o'clock in the morning? How long is yoga going to take? What do you think? Uh, if, if just you warm up the body and you, you know, just loosen things up, no more than 20 minutes. Yeah. Oh, 20 minutes is short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we'll keep our schedule the same and the exercise period between 9.30 and, and 10. And, and so if some of you want to come in here and do yoga, okay, and then others want to go out, stand outside and with the trees and with... Uh, uh, I mean, some of us will do qigong and uh, some of us will do yoga. Okay. Okay? okay. <laughs> All right, good. All right, back to Dharma. Okay, yeah. What do you think about the uh, Shiolen Chandina Buddha in practice? <laughs> what was it, some, some time? Well, that's... Uh, what do I personally think? I, I, I personally would think it's uh, it would be much better to become enlightened in this lifetime and do the practices that are going to lead to uh, enlightenment in in this lifetime. That's my personal view. But uh, as many people who feel that uh, they would they would like to uh, you know, chant the name of Amida Buddha and be uh, reborn in uh, Tavitamsa heaven so that they could achieve enlightenment there, you know. That's fine with me, but... (laughs) 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 But uh, my perspective in my life has been it's it's the suffering of this life that I want to overcome. And uh, it's the the, uh, true understanding that I want to achieve. And even more than that, it's being able to do something in this, in this life to help other people to achieve liberation in this life. What, so, what about uh, if we take the uh, Chenyin of Buddha's name as a kind of a meditation practice? As a meditation practice, uh, it, it is a meditation practice that can do a lot for uh, calming the mind and, and focusing the mind. I, it's to the degree that it helps you to develop a calm, focused mind, you might be able to do some Vipassana practices uh, 
using that degree of concentration that it gives you. But uh, I personally think that that's about the extent of what you would get from that practice is a, uh, a calm state of mind. Uh, not necessarily this, the, the same kind of concentration that we're talking about developing here, but it would it does calm the mind. Chanting does, is very calming. She will make all of her, her effort to, to get enlightened this lifetime. Yes. But, but not the, if, if it didn't happen, in, in the rare case that didn't happen, no, in the case that didn't happen, uh, please make sure that you come find back, her. Find her next life. Uh, okay. Assuming you're coming back. She's determined, but just in case. Okay. Please yeah. remember, find her and me too. <laughs> we, okay. we have an agreement, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, Michael. Uh, I have a question about uh, the energy flow to the top portion of the, the body. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like uh, if the energy doesn't, you know, one way or another come up and permeate the body or at the very least go to the top of the head, um, the quality of the mindfulness and, and the vividness of the mindfulness is, is, is a lot less. And sometimes the energy will come in a surge, and sometimes it, it comes in comes up very very calmly and mm-hmm. per- pervasively to the whole body. But the thing is, uh, I, I sense a huge difference uh, in terms of the quality of the mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree with that. But on the other thing, hand the thing that I would like to point out is not everyone even ex- experiences this movement of energy. And people who don't still uh, experience very, very profound states of, uh, of uh, concentration with very strong mindfulness with which they are able to uh, achieve, achieve liberating insight. Oh, so even with, without this flowing energy, uh, one can achieve very clear vividness in the observation. Yes. I, I, but let us uh, say, even without being aware of this movement of energy, because it's really difficult to say. When when so many people experience a movement of energy in the body that is so strongly associated with uh, the development of concentration and with the arising of joy, uh, you know, and then other people don't, uh, all that we can do is say, well, Perhaps for one reason or another, they're not aware of it in the same way, and to the same degree. So I see. Yeah. But yeah, in as much as uh, if you are a person who has a clear experience of these energy movements, once again, in general, part of that experience will be that upward movement that uh, that, that's very noticeable and that is sort of a culmination of the development of that process. So. On the other hand, some people have trouble with that and you know they feel a lot of energy moving in the body from the, from the core to the periphery back and forth. And uh, it seems to serve the same purpose and at some point they, their body becomes saturated with, uh, with uh, that PT energy too. Um, hold up. Sorry. Um, well, since uh, I see a direct relationship between the energy going to the upper part of the body and mm-hmm. uh, clear, clarity of, of observation, uh, would, would it be advisable to, to try to give rise to this energy? And, you know, it's almost like another kind of manipulation, too, because the energy follows the intention a lot of the times, mm-hmm. not all the time. Yeah. But most of the time it does. Um, let me just point out that we're really talking about meditation rather than dharma, which is all right, but we'll, we'll get to dharma here soon. Hopefully. Oh, okay, sorry. But um, what I would say is for anyone who experiences energy movement, primarily just let it develop, 
Then the next thing is if the if the movement of that energy is creating any sort of problem or distraction because it seems to be obstructed or it's producing strong movements or things like that. That's an appropriate time to try to work with it and uh, perhaps, as you say, manipulate it somewhat, primarily so that you can go back to the practice without uh, uh, being distracted. And then hopefully that, that energy will continue doing what it needs to do without you needing to do anything. But if you are particularly sensitive to the energy and you find that spending some uh, part of your meditation effort on directing that energy to achieve a particularly uh, powerfully clear state of mind is beneficial, then by all means do that. That would be that would be a sensible and reasonable thing to do. But I don't want it to sound like everybody should start looking for energy experiences or if they experience uh, sort of electrical vibration in their body that they begin trying to cause it to rise up their spine. <clears throat> when it begins to rise up the spine and you're not really ready for it, that's when it creates a lot of discomfort and problems and distraction. So if you have energy experiences, as much as possible, just continue with your concentration practice and let them develop on their own, at least and unless they start creating a problem. Okay? Yeah. Um, can I talk about meditation in the Dharma? Um, you can, but I was I was really hoping that I would have this opportunity in the evenings to uh, okay. to. How many do you talk about the Dharma? <laughs> but maybe everybody's more interested in meditation, and here I am trying to make things go in a way that doesn't work. Well, I, I like to listen to the Dharma. <laughs> What's that? I, I like you to speak about the Dharma. <laughs> Okay. So, and, and like I say, there's so much to speak about with regard to the Buddha Dharma that uh, it's hard for me to decide where to begin. <laughs> That's what I was really looking for was where there was some question that could help be a beginning point for the discussion. What we did talk about uh, so far was the four. Noble Truths, and we talked somewhat about the Eightfold Path, but not every part of it in great detail. Um, in a logical progression, we might next talk about, for example, the three characteristics of impermanence, uh, uh, not-self, and uh, uh, the satisfactoriness. Um, but it can go any direction. We could talk about karma, we could talk about, we could go back to the Eightfold Path and talk about the uh, uh, virtue, and, and actually, we could talk about the practice of the perfection. So, there's all kinds of directions you could take. Did you have a particular suggestion? Uh, that you would? Uh, not, yeah, personal preference, and I have a suggestion because I, I would like to have a, a few minutes of very short statements, then maybe that will lead into the selfless, but I don't know if that selflessness are you mm -hmm. interested to talk about in that. And self selflessness. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, explain because I I don't want to because I lack of the uh, ability to express well and cause some misunderstanding mm -hmm. for my uh, uh, statement this noon time. And uh, I do have a breath too, but I just want to explain that in this field, I already work on selflessness for several months and cons uh, uh, Conceptually, I try, uh, I understand uh, that they talk about selfness and make a lot of sense intellectually to me. But however, feelingly, I still feel strongly I have that sense of identity and I don't know how to get away. And this few days of this retreat, in fact, I concentrate on watching mine, you know, observe the mind very in detail level. And this morning, just kind of uh, through the, the, the observing the, the mind, and I come out some question and ask the teacher, and give me some clarification. A very interesting thing I just want to mention to you is that maybe that can help every one of us to, to, to practice Dharma. 
is when I concentrate with that and the, after the interview and I said they'll meditate and I, I, strange things happen is the the mind work on itself you know and link the the, 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 the observing mind and the, uh, the, the selflessness the, the self identity that part you know and I it, just like I want to mention, it's like a teacher say that it's, I didn't do it. You know, it's not me. I just kind of the awareness is for the, the things happen and connect itself. So, so what my point is that even though sometimes we work on something, if we don't go through that, sometimes we work on other things and, and that link, you know, for us to, to realize that in some way. So just be patient and, and, and do the steps. Now give me more confidence I do the steps one by that. And, and sometimes the, those things will, will, will connect. You know, I don't know when, but for the circum, uh, circumstance ready and uh, uh, every condition ready, and that will, the, and, and, and I certainly feel very clearly I didn't do it. You know, it's that things happen. And, and, and to work. So I just want to explain to everybody, and I appreciate you ask a question and clarify, because I, I'm afraid I jump in something, ex my, my excitement and, and, and to report, I want to get the teacher's feedback and give us, give everybody kind of a strange feeling. So I want to explain that it's my experience. So maybe you will experience that similar path or even more strange way, but, but that will happen. I don't know how it happened. I still don't know, but it happened. I just witnessed that. Thank you. Thank you. 我有個問題很好奇,就是說你對於你這個抉擇,你感到非常的興奮,很高興,是不是這樣的?聽你的口氣好像你蠻興奮,蠻高興的。Yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, did you meditate yourself? No, not really. Just uh, like that. Uh, 但是我一般只是好像我聽到大家有什麼樣的覺知的時候不會是很高興的,是會有警惕的,所以我不知道我想問老師說是不是有這個不同的心態這樣子。So she is asking her that feels like she was very excited and happy about mm -hmm. Uh, Sophia's question to, to you was typically when people um, break through have breakthroughs they, they typically are you want to say guarded or on guard or guarded alerted, alerted, alerted cautious or, um, that when typically a people act more uh, cautious uh, people's first reaction is to be more cautious and alert um, aware. Mm -hmm. more, more awareness. She doesn't understand why she didn't understand why she was so excited and <laughs> Well I mean, part of it is Deborah's personality. She's <laughs> that's the kind of person she is. <laughs> She's very eager to uh, to learn and discover these things, and when she does, she gets really excited about it. <laughs> so, you know, whereas uh, someone else might uh, react differently. Uh, also, uh, Deborah's practice involves a lot of strong strong concentration. There's a lot of meditative joy and happiness that is the flavor of her practice all the time, and so. Uh, and this is the way it is. Insights tend to, when, when you have insight, it tends to bring out that joyfulness. And so it's, I think it's that combination of different things, just just the way Deborah is and the fact that her practice has a really strong component of, of joy in it. And and so when, when she has an insight, those things come together and, and you see what you saw. She has tremendous enthusiasm. And, uh, and happy. Different people will... Uh, respond differently. And these very same insights for some people, uh, especially who do not have, haven't developed concentration to the point, 
of having this uh, meditative joy and happiness, this piti sukha, as it's called, um, uh, when they don't have that, sometimes these insights can be more frightening than, you know, rather than exciting and relieving, they can, they can create uh, great di- mental discomfort. Um, the uh, people who do inside practice without developing concentration first, what's called uh, dry insight practice or, or uh, uh, sukha vipassana uh, yanikas, uh, people who are practicing the dry insight practices, when they come to the stage where they start to have profound insights, uh, they experience a lot of uh, mental and emotional discomfort. And they, they find these insight, these same insights frightening and difficult to assimilate. So it depends on the degree of equanimity and joy that the person has too. And that in turn depends on the kind of practice they're doing. So that's why you might see different people responding in different ways. Let's continue the question for last night. Um, my friend, and he, when he was a teenager, and he was ascending, I think, a meditative state. So that that state lasts like uh, uh, several hours, mm-hmm. and uh, basically he feel he, he uh, lost himself. Mm-hmm. So kind of conscious expansion to hold everywhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, after he kind of wake up, and he just keep laughing. Mm-hmm. The reason he laughed, he said, because um, uh, the way he sees the things, it's, it's it's just like uh, everything is perfect existed. Yes. And during the process, uh, from the expansion, expanded consciousness, mm-hmm. and to uh, to wake up, mm-hmm. he, he described that there's a kind of pattern of uh, self develops. So my question is, how human beings or sentient beings uh, psychologically or mentally built by this way, we tend to uh, think or act uh, this way. That's that's kind of self. We know that Buddhism explains that it's, uh, it's karmic, it's karma, and uh, because of the ignorance. But how? Why? I think your question is, is why we have this experience of self the way we do. Consciousness of self. Mm-hmm. You know, but of course there's no, no first beginning, but how we will think this way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so if I understand this correctly, basically the question is, why do we have this the, the, the kind of sense of self that we do. Mm, yeah. Is that what it be? Is that a way of putting the question? Where does it come from? So, but uh, if uh, it's, it's, it's Buddhist, if it's Buddhist, Buddhist, and, uh, Buddhist answer, that would be, yeah, um, because we are not understanding the true nature of the, That's right. the, the, the things, you know. We, yeah. we look at things uh, in a different way, not as they, they really are. That, that's the immediate cause. It's because we are ignorant that we, uh, we don't see things the way they really are that we experience this. But the question, the, 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 the deeper question is, but why, why do we have this particular, why does this happen that there yeah. is this particular yeah. ignorance? Yeah. Where is I, I can relate to that because before mm-hmm. that, uh, the, the self, the feeling mm-hmm. is so strong and mm-hmm. so real, you know, feel having a self, e- mm-hmm. even though teaching is that, mm-hmm. say, oh, understand, but still feeling so strong. Okay, good. This, is, this will be a good thing to talk about. Yes. To so. add on to that question, I just want to, maybe you could also say a few words about neuroscience and, uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Because there are so many cases of, uh, you know, injuries that the, the, the symptom, feel, uh, to me, read like what you know, what is described? Are you, you thinking of Jill Bolte Taylor, uh, who had the stroke? Is, is that? Uh, I, I heard the story that somebody had, I don't know the name, but yeah. half of the brain was, uh, mm-hmm. yes. and afterwards 
he just he was unsure he wanted to recover the other mm-hmm. half of the brain. Right. Yeah, that person uh, uh, who's a woman. Her name is Jill oh, okay. uh, Jill Bolte Taylor. Jill Taylor, and she was. Uh, she was a neuroscientist who had a stroke, and yes, yeah, so she wrote a book. It's called "Stroke of Insight." Oh right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So, so can we um, listen to you talk? I mm-hmm. mean, uh, all of us. <laughs> can we just uh, kind of shut up for a little bit? Because <laughs> <laughs> the time is so well, precious. We really want to hear you say. Well, yes, so we're, we're we're going to have a discussion about. About the uh, this this idea of, of non-self as a Dharma talk topic, the topic of anatta or non-self, and it is in fact one of the most difficult uh, topics in all of Buddhism to grasp. Uh, but on that topic, is there any other particular perspective that someone has in their mind? So that way, when we we're going to have a conversation about it, so. If you have a perspective on that topic, please share it with us before we begin. No, I, I just kind of disappointed. You know, how how can I jump in other uh, stage? Uh, I, I think I just start uh, this stage. The meditation stage? Or? Sorry, I didn't understand that. So that needs some meditation. Meditation,在这个阶段。哦，你说我们现在就一直没有啊？我们现在不是讲meditation。我知道。他问是，他他怎么样？有些有些有些有些进展，有些进步，对不对？对。他他们就讲，就是说那个什么收获来讲。但是
the body dies and seeking for an answer to that. So this is this is what the atta that anatta is negating is about is this idea of a permanent and abiding self that might live forever in one form or another. And of course there are some teachings that say that there is a permanent abiding self which uh, is reincarnated lifetime after lifetime just like a person putting on a new suit of clothes each day. And this, when the Buddha taught that there, that this was a false view, this was a profoundly different and new teaching because um, materialists, at that time there were materialists who said, well, this is all there is. There is no soul, there's nothing, there's just, you know, there's just this life, and there's nothing after this. And, of course, there are many materialists today who hold that view. Many, uh, it's a very common view. that the, This life is all there is, and uh, all you can do is uh, have as much pleasure as you can, and uh, morality really means not getting caught more than anything else. <laughs> do do whatever you can to gratify yourself as best you can because you're going to die anyway and none of it matters in the end. And then the opposite view to that has been there is a permanent and abiding soul and this soul might go to heaven or hell or be reborn in heaven or hells, heavens or hell or be reborn over and over again and uh, uh, perhaps this perhaps this uh, permanent abiding self can escape the round of constant reincarnations and having to go through all these difficulties over and over again. Buddha took a very different perspective on things. He examined the situation of us as human beings and that we go through our lives with an experience of greater or lesser degree of dissatisfaction and, and unhappiness and even uh, despairing acceptance of the inevitability of pain and sickness and old age and death. And his question was, can that be overcome? Is there some way to, is there some answer to this, some solution to this? Can it be overcome? And after his enlightenment, any time someone asked him, and they did on a number of occasions, you know, what is it that you teach? Because many of the other teachers of that time were teaching uh, a particular philosophy or metaphysics or a point of view. And he said, I teach only one thing. I teach uh, uh, suffering and freedom, the way to freedom from suffering, the freedom from dissatisfaction, unhappiness. We've talked about how he taught that the cause of dukkha is craving, and that when there is a cessation of craving, there is a cessation of dukkha. This is the liberation within this life uh, from Dukkha. Now, in addition to that, he said that someone who achieves this liberation does not need to worry about re- being reborn in, uh, over and over again in an endless series of circumstances. In other words, you don't have to keep being reborn into Dukkha so that once you, once you gain this knowledge that's liberating, you are completely free from that once and for all. So, the teaching of not self, how does this fit in with that? Well, it's negating the idea 
that you should put all of your energy into trying to identify your true self and protect that true self. And it also negates the idea that um, that you should uh, spend your energy trying to uh, gratify and satisfy this self. This self is an illusion. This is the highest truth. Is the self that we all experience is not real. And it's the fact that it's not real that is the root ignorance that keeps, that gives craving its power and therefore that's why we suffer. So, you know, in, in the process that we were working from that life is filled with dukkha, craving causes dukkha, the cessation of dukkha is brought about by the cessation of craving. But the cessation of craving cannot be achieved until a person has overcome the ignorance that gives rise to this sense of self that we have. So let's examine this sense of self. Anatta, not self, does not mean that we are denying, uh, that doesn't mean that a person is supposed to abolish their ego. Because the ego is a psychological function of the mind. But it's to stop believing in that ego as a substantial reality and stop having all of your thoughts and feelings and actions and emotions and everything conditioned by the belief in that ego as being a substantial reality. So what are we? What is the self? And right away, when you say self, that means there's something that's not self, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look to discover what is our self. Well, most clearly, I have, there is this body that seems to be separate from the rest of the world, right? And as a matter of fact, I think all of us um, as children probably identified self with the body very strongly. It's, it's the sort of natural way that we are. Yes? In the, in the uh, early age of uh, the boy, when the, when, the, when the child is an infant, mm-hmm. uh, psychologically, they, they don't think uh, they have very um, distinctive mm-hmm. um, self you know, in terms of body. They develop the idea of body story. That's right. They start out, an infant starts out really with none of these concepts at all. And they, uh, in the development of a child, it's, it, it's not until a certain stage in development that they have any sense of self at all. Yeah, that's true. Or any conceptualization. But I'm starting more from the point of Granted that in life we have a sense of self, even that uh, changes over time. And most of you, I, I doubt if any of you really think of yourself as your body, but nevertheless you have a really strong sense of being a self, right? Of course. Yeah, you have a very strong sense of being a self. So if you can look and say, what, what is this self that I am? Uh, and most of us would probably quite easily regard the body as not the self. You know, you could uh, you could even imagine in sort of a science fiction scenario, maybe where uh, your brain could be transplanted into a different body, and you'd still the the, the self that you identify with wouldn't really be different. Right? And people have arm transplants and heart transplants and, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you lose a leg, you don't lose part of yourself. You lose part of your body and it's really much more like something that would happen to your house or your car. Like your body is more an appendage or something that belongs to the self. When it comes to the mind now, we tend to much more strongly identify ourselves with our mind, right? Uh, that is probably... Uh, 
that's probably the strongest uh, attachment to the sense of self you have, is feeling that you are your mind. But even there, you know, if you uh, if you look into yourself and say, "Who am I? What what am I?" You will most likely identify uh, a group of attributes that we might call your personality or your personal self, and there will be some of those that are quite variable and quite changeable and that you wouldn't really claim to be yourself. They more are just temporary properties and, and attributes. But there is this sense of, uh, uh, of you as a person. Well, and, and some things that are relatively stable and unchanging. I am this kind of a person. I am, uh, I am a male or I am a female. And uh, I am more intelligent or less intelligent or uh, I'm artistic or I'm not as artistic or I'm creative or I'm not creative or all of these different kinds of things. We don't need to get into the details of this but generally we go around with sort of a vague idea in our mind that we are a self and if we were pushed to identify that, uh, uh, that self we we'd start making up a list of things. But we'd have to work at it, would you not? I mean, that would be, that's sort of, if, if, if you had the task to come up with a, uh, a, an explanation or a description of who you are, that would be a challenging task, would it not? Difficult to decide. Well, in the process of making that list, you'd be inventing, you'd be inventing a self. And if you look at your behavior and how you live your life, you realize you're always going around inventing yourself. When you are with your parents, you're one kind of self. If you're married and have children, when you're at home with that family, you're a different kind of self. When you're at work, you're yet another kind of self. When you're socializing with your friends, there's another self involved. Um, Most of us, as uh, young people, have had the experience of you're attracted to somebody and you go out on a date with them. And what do you do? You spend a lot of time trying to create a particular type of self, right? I'm not sure. We, we don't think about it too much, but we try to invent a self that we think they'll like and say, this is who I am. I guess with the idea that by the time they find out it's not quite true, it'll be too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> or even better, what happens is, uh, is sometimes we meet somebody, enter into a relationship with them, and we really want to be the kind of self that they think they are. There's a friend of mine has a, a sign on her door that says, God, please make me the kind of person my cat thinks I am. <laughs> and have you ever done that? Some of you, I'm sure, have. Uh, been in a relationship where you thought, well, if I can just become the person this person thinks I am, then, wow, that will be wonderful. I'll be... You know, that would be a definite improvement. Or sometimes that happens, you'll get a job, and you, you say, well, I'm going to become the kind of self that this job needs. That's the kind of self I want to be, because I want to have this job. And can you relate to these things that I'm saying? Yes. So, I mean, right away, we examine self, and we realize self is a mental construct. Self is a mental construct that is generated by our mind dependent upon all kinds of different external and internal circumstances. Um, we, even, we even chop ourselves up inside between uh, the things that, you know, I'm this kind of person and I know I do those things sometimes, but that's not really me. Right? <laughs> And, and then we want to cut off and avoid and, and, and overcome those things. That's not really me, so I'm going to cut off that part of me and never be like that again. You've probably done that too. 
The self is it's a mental construct. It's an invention of your mind. It's one that changes constantly. It changes from situation to situation and day to day, month to month, year to year. Uh, if you met yourself, if, uh, if your self from 10 years ago uh, were to show up here today, I wonder how you get along with them. <laughs> oh, it's going to have hard time. Uh, would, it, would it be you? Would it be the you that you are now? Okay. So, this personality self, and we're very attached to it, because if somebody says something about this self, uh, it can either make us very happy or very unhappy or angry, right? So when we, if we have a notion uh, that we're a particular kind of person, and somebody says uh, that we're the opposite, and, and that's, uh, you know, and maybe you believe that you're a very uh, righteous and honest person, and and somebody says, well, you know, he's kind of a, a real dishonest and kind of a liar. Boy, you know, you really don't like that at all, right? And it's a different reaction than if you think of yourself as being kind of lazy and somebody says, well, he's kind of lazy. It's like, you might not like it that they're pointing it out, but it's a different reaction than if somebody says you're something that you don't believe you are, right? So so we have a lot of reactions to that. Also, if you'd really like to be a particular kind of person, you know, I'd really like to be wise, and then somebody says, well, he's really wise, and you go, oh, it makes you feel, how does it make you feel? Wonderful, right? Yeah. So we can examine Deborah tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> if she never get mad, then I believe her. <laughs> so, we have, if we examine this, on the one hand, we have this mental construct that we create and is constantly changing, but that we're very defensive of and very attached to, and uh, that we can, uh, a, a, it, it can have a tremendous influence on, on our actions and our happiness and, and everything else. So that's one sense in which we experience a self. Um, And that's also a fairly easy one to look at and say, well, that's not all that real. It's, it, it's, it's certainly not a permanent and abiding self, right? It's not an enduring, abiding, permanent self. Yes? Um, just to play devil's advocate, uh, the, if the Buddha says that the, you know, the present moment is the only real moment or the only real in reality even uh, in any given moment that self may be real because mm-hmm. even if it is transient and over time it, you know, it, it constantly continues but in any given moment all the conditions that are there that self is is a self is real right sure it has to play with. Yeah. but it's it's uh, if if, uh, if you are going to completely completely take this view that the present moment is the only time, is, is the only moment there is, then there is there is no meaning to speaking of a permanent and enduring self. Uh, if, if there's another moment and another self, that's still the only self there is. So, uh, In what sense is it a problem for us in, in, in trying to understand the nature of self to adopt the view that... Uh, this present, I, and it's not just a view; it's a fact. The present moment is the only thing there is. But I mean, but even the, the present moment is a concept. The present the moment concept. is that well, as well. Uh, in in a sense, or the other way we could look at it is say the future and the past are concepts. You know, so and the present the present moment only has meaning as a concept if we have future and past as concepts. So we we sort of have. To have one, we have to have them all. Right. Which I, I suppose is uh, is the answer to that. Unless you have a concept of, uh, of, of 
future and past, then the idea of the present moment has uh, that doesn't have any meaning. It is true that the only thing there is is the present moment, but there is a certain kind of flow rather than staticness to the present moment, and we have a sense of self in it, and so we're still stuck with with the same situation. We're we're going to adjust the schedule and talk for another 15 minutes and then uh, have a break from meditation, okay? Um, Where were we here? Self. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, but yes, by all means, anything, any question you have or doubt you have uh, about any aspect of this, let's let's by all means talk about it and and make it clear. Yes? I, I think self is uh, because a lot of attachment. Can people uh, re- release a, a patch mm-hmm. uh, and can uh, and can uh, delete the self image? Yes. Well, in, in a sense, you're 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 cutting down to a, a, a very essential component of this. Ultimately, less important than what we might set aside and stick the label self on is the fact that we are attached to the idea of a self. Whatever that self happens to be, we're attached to the idea of a self. And that's where, that's really the problem. Right? Because... And, and, and if we continue this examination, uh, we see, uh, our, in terms of past, present, and future, you know, this construct that we have, we can grant that it's constantly changing, it's not permanent, it's not abiding, but nevertheless, we have an experience of continuity, which makes it real. You know, I may not be the same person I was 10 years ago, or 40 years ago, but there's a continuity there. And I, there's a causal continuity, and I attach to it on the basis of that because that continuity is there, makes it easy for me to attach to that. And, and you, that attachment manifests in a lot of ways, in a lot of the same ways that we've just been talking about. Um, you ever hear people telling stories about the self that they once were and the things that they did? It makes them feel good, you know, and they're obviously not that self anymore. This is especially true of, uh, you know, of older people. They'll tell you about when they were younger and how wonderful they were, (laughs) and they'll take great satisfaction in it. And you'll either enjoy the story or you'll just think, I don't know why this person thinks this is so important, but (laughs) who cares? (laughs) But... This is, there's this attachment to a sense of self that's based in the continuity. Okay, there's another, there's another experience of selfhood that we attach to, very important, very strongly. When we experience pain, or when we experience pleasure, it's the experiencer, right? It's the, uh, the, the self is who's hurting. Or the self is who is 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 happy, and we attach to to that self. It's more difficult to see. I mean, if you look at that, it's a little more difficult to see. Well, okay, uh, that too is not self, but that it, that's getting to where it certainly seems like it's self, doesn't it? To What's that? It's easy to understand. It's easy to understand, but hard to do. It's a long way. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to understand, you know, yeah. the, this kind of analytic way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But self is very strong feeling. Yeah. And a lot of time it's by comparison mm-hmm. because uh, if I realize that uh, by this way I understand there's no self, mm-hmm. and my whole social is talk to my mm-hmm. friends and uh, they talk their story, his story, her story, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the citizen is in their job, and so, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. he is what, what, and then I am mm-hmm. just get this way. And all of that 
is susceptible to analysis and understanding. And analysis and understanding may not free us from it, but at least it's very susceptible to analysis and understanding. But we're getting now down to something that the experiencing self, the sense that, well, I'm the one that hurts. <laughs> I, I, everything else may be an illusion, but there's somebody hurting there, and that's who I identify with. That's, that's, there's an attachment to that. Okay? And that's very strong at the, at the, uh, at the level of feeling. Now, this takes us to, to properly understand the nature of this feeling and how to deal with it. This, it's a feeling of selfhood that arises as the experiencer of pleasure and pain. And I, I think I mentioned to you that this is the one thing, you know, we use the term sentient beings. What is a sentient being, anyway? What do we mean by a sentient being? Nama and Rupa together. Nama and Rupa defines an individual and uh, part of Nama is, is Vedana, feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Uh, would we regard a, a dog as a sentient being? Yes. Right. Would we regard a lizard as a sentient being? Yes. Fish? Yes. Grasshopper? Yes. Uh, bacteria? Yes. Um, tree? No. no. Rock? No. Okay. What's the difference? At what point does something become sentient? Uh, sense or not? Um, sense, sense of itself. Uh, what's that? I said the the sensory organ. Well, okay, it has a, some kind of a sense organ. Well, um, I, I would say that a being is sentient if it experiences pleasure or, or pleasantness and unpleasantness. It can experience pleasure and pain. Because depending on the kinds of sense organs, there's all kinds of beings that have all kinds of different senses and experience all kinds of different things. So if we're going to look at something that is experienced by means of sense organs that is common to everything we would call sentient, I think it would be pleasantness and unpleasant. So it is our nature as a sentient being to experience pleasure and pain. And that's what we identify with you know, at a feeling level, an emotional level, as, as the, the self. The self is, the self is the one that's experiencing pleasure and pain. Now, I, I hope some of you have been doing some meditation on examining uh, pleasant and unpleasant feeling that is based in the physical versus pleasant and unpleasant that is based in the mental, and reflecting on what I have said that all beings, including fully enlightened Buddhas, have an experience of pleasant and unpleasant physical sensation. So physical pleasure and pain are inevitable, inescapable, they are a part of being a living being, a sentient being. Whether you whether you are Buddha or not, if you are a sentient being, there is physical pleasure and pain. But if you are a Buddha, what you are liberated from is any form of mental suffering and mental pain. Okay? And now let's go back to this question of the sense of self that we get in experiencing uh, pleasure and pain. If you can make the distinction between physical pain 
and physical pleasure as mere sensation, as a mere type of sensation. And maybe if you've had some experience in meditation that have shown you that. If you have some understanding of equanimity, and equanimity is where when physical pleasure or physical pain arise, there is no mental pleasure and pain in response to it. There is no attachment to it or pushing away of it, no attachment or aversion associated with it. Perhaps you've had some time in your life, a few moments, uh, some circumstance where you've had that experience, or perhaps you've come close enough that you can imagine it. Now, where this sense of self that we have associated with experience of pleasure and pain What is it rooted in? Is it rooted in mental pleasure and pain or physical pleasure and pain as mere sensation? Mental. Hmm? Can you ask simple pleasure again? Okay. And maybe you won't be able to answer it. Maybe, Maybe you don't have the experience you need yet to do that. But the question was, We know that when we have a a pleasant or an unpleasant experience, there's a strong sense of self associated with the experience, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is that sense of self associated with mental pain and mental pleasure? Or is it associated with physical pain and physical pleasure? Or both? Or is there a difference? Maybe you don't know the answer to that. Um, Let's look at sensation, because when I say physical pain and physical pleasure, they are mere sensation. And uh, if you can cease to react mentally, you can discover that indeed they are mere sensation. You do have other experience of mere sensation, right? When you're doing walking meditation and you're trying to, or let's say when you're doing meditation on the breath, and you're trying to notice exactly when the in-breath begins, that's a sensation, right? Is it difficult or easy to identify that sensation? Don't you find that there are many, many sensations arising, passing away, just a continuous stream of sensations arising, passing away, arising, and passing away, arising, and passing away. That is the nature of all sensation. All sensation is constantly changing. It's, 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 it's impermanent. It's impermanent at, at the most minute level. It's just it's coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, so fast. This is the nature of pleasure and physical pleasure and pain is in sensation. It is completely impermanent. Now, if you can clearly perceive pleasure and pain as mere sensation, entirely impermanent, arising and passing away, do you think you will have the same strong sense of identity with that sensation? I mean, the sensation of coolness as the air begins to go into your nostrils, do you attach to that as That is self, that is I. More likely you have the experience of there's just the sensation. There's no sense of, there's really no sense of I in there at all. There's just the experience of the sensation. It's more neutral. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's a more neutral sensation, right? But, you know, the the sense of I-ness doesn't arise really strongly. Perhaps one of the things you might notice when you're meditating is uh, when your attention is is uh, on one thing, there is no sense of I at all. I mean, that happens all the time. All the time, you're watching a movie and you're so engrossed in the movie that you completely forget yourself, or your mind's wandering in meditation and you're so deeply thinking in a thought that you forget yourself. 
There's no sense of self. The sense of self is optional. It's not always there. Sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Whenever the sense of self is there, it arises as a mental object. It is a mental construct. It is a mental formation. When you have pain, physical pain, and you react to that with mental pain and suffering, then the identification that you experience when you say, I am suffering, that is yet another mental object that has arisen in the series. Right? And so, uh, now when I say that it is very, the idea of not-self is very, it's not easily grasped, it's not easily discovered, but it is so crucial to discover it. But through, through logical thinking and examination, we can at least uh, satisfy ourselves intellectually that indeed, although it seems so real, the feeling of self, that it's difficult to find any reality in which it is based. So this gives us hope. Um, And we just, we're we're just getting into, I'm enjoying telling you all about this. And uh, It's okay, we have all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please continue. Please continue. Over the knees, the teacher might be tired, though. The Sophia? He needs his rest. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 我们心没有参与的时候他就不痛所以我们在禅坐的时候我们可以做到这一点那我们禅坐的意义就是说下了坐的时候我们都把它当了神追寻心不进去的时候这个时候是不是就是无我那如果这是无我我就可以体会到平
understands the nature of not self, this person is extremely hard to uh, be insulted because he knows or she knows that he's both ugly and pretty all at the same time. And if somebody says that he's ugly, he's going to be offended. If somebody says he's pretty, he's not going to think it's something unusual. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's um, where this all fits in. <coughs> You see, what, what maybe is beginning to emerge is that <clears throat> our, our problems originate in our mind. We have a mental construct of, of self, which uh, <clears throat> causes a lot of our, our suffering. And then we have the feeling of a, a self, and that feeling of self arises as a result of mental suffering and mental pleasure that are there. Okay? We examine reality and we see that trying to manipulate the circumstances of the world in order to achieve uh, happiness and avoid suffering is not going to work. At the same time, we see that the real root of our suffering is the mental suffering and the real source of happiness is likewise. So if we can, if we, this is where we want to work. We want to give up trying to manipulate the world and instead see how we can work with the mind. And that's the way that we can overcome suffering and that's the way that we can find, that's the way that we can achieve the end of craving and therefore enjoy the, the perfect satisfaction and, and happiness, the blissful happiness that comes from the end of craving. So the solution is within the mind. It starts to become more and more clear. Okay? Yes? Yes? Uh, um, so, um, so the combination of mental perception and with the body sensation mm -hmm. um, so so there, there's this continu there's a continuity of um, rising falling rising falling and of sensations yeah. sensations and and the mind projects that as some kind of continuality that mm -hmm. because of that we have sense of self so if so if we could actually see, all the individual rising and falling, uh, whether it's mental or physical, then we could actually see that there is no self. That's right. You, we can add, we can not just through the things that you mentioned, but through a common that plus a combination of other things, come to the point of saying that none of these things is real as a self and by clearly seeing that we lose the attachment and we lose the suffering that goes along with that. Let me put this in the context of the stages of enlightenment. Okay? An arhat, a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, is completely free from cravings of every kind. But there are four stages and that's the fourth stage. In the first stage of enlightenment, a person has the experience of understanding the true nature of things. The result of which is that they permanently lose the belief and attachment in the personal self. That's this constructed view uh, that we can, without too much difficulty, see this personal self, this personality self, as a construct. But it doesn't change the fact that no matter that we sit and see that it's a construct, it's, we still behave and suffer as though it was real. Okay, what happens in the first stage of enlightenment is that is overcome. You have understood reality in such a way that it instantly destroys forever the belief in and attachment to that personal self. So you're no longer vulnerable to that in the same way. Wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this, the belief in and attachment to this self has been, 
has been sustaining craving. And we have no hope of ever eliminating craving as long as we still believe in this self. And so now we've made, we've made a very important step for, forward. When you become a stream winner, a stream entrant, because now you, you, you've seen the truth and you'll never again believe in this personal self as real. You still have craving, you still have desire and aversion. You haven't uprooted those, but you've eliminated an important part of its support. Now, when you experience pleasure and pain as a stream winner, you will still have some experience of the sense of self. You know, it'll still be my toe that hurts when you stand on it. Even though, you know, you don't believe in that whole construct, you'll still have that feeling. But as as we pointed out, where does that feeling come from? That feeling comes from the mental pain that we suffer, not from the physical sensation that happened when you stepped on my toe. It comes from the mental pain, the mental suffering that was generated. Where did the mental suffering come from? The mental suffering came from craving. The aversion to the unpleasant physical sensation and the uh, craving to have the, the, the pain go away and the source of the pain go away. Now, the second stage of enlightenment is, is called the uh, once returner. Okay? And what happens when somebody becomes a once returner is that craving is greatly weakened which means that there is not the same reaction of mental suffering to the physical pain that arises. There's much, much more equanimity to all sensation, and there's much less craving. And so the uh, once-returner is somebody who has tremendously attenuated the force of craving, as a result of which, the feeling of self associated with painful and pleasurable experiences is is completely transparent. You know, not that it doesn't arise, but it it's seen through. It's not, you know, it doesn't have that same reality and believability. The third stage of enlightenment is called the non-returner. And what characterizes the non-returner, what makes that a distinct stage, is that craving, sensual craving, in other words, the desire for pleasure and uh, uh, and the aversion to pain, in its most subtle forms, has been completely destroyed. The non-returner has no craving related to sensual experience. No desire and aversion at the sensual level. So there is none of this, there is no longer any source for the feeling of self arising out of sentient experience of pleasure and pain. There is though one thing that's left, and we didn't talk about that, it's called the inherent sense of self even beyond the feeling of selfhood that arises in the presence of pleasure and pain. That notwithstanding, there is the sense of being a separately existing entity. This is the ultimate and deepest level of selfhood that we experience. Even when we're past all pleasure and pain, even when we no longer have a feeling of selfhood arising in response to sensual experience, there is still this sense that we are a, a, a separate, alien existing being. And that is described in terms of the, the non-returner is said to completely overcome craving related to the senses, but has left one form of craving, the craving 
still for existence and still has the inherent sense of self. These two go together. As long as you have this inherent sense that you are a separate existent being, there is the craving for that existence. Right? So that's why the first three still need to be born. That's right. Then why so specifically for seven times for the spring winner? Why seven? Why seven? It's a lucky number. <laughs> <laughs> I think what what the number seven means. Okay, it, uh, you know what is said is that they they don't necessarily have to be reborn at all, but they may be reborn seven times. And the meaning of that is they're not going to have to re, be reborn some huge number of times. But. If they don't, if they don't liberate themselves, they may have to go through this a few more turns of the wheel. So it's uh, it's another way. I, I, there's another way of understanding that that I will explain to you. Maybe, let me just continue on with just the, the final thing. Here. The final thing, when the non-returner becomes an arhat, then there is no longer that inherent sense of self as a separately existing being. And there is no longer the craving for existence in any form. And that's what makes an arhat an arhat. Okay? So these, you see how these things are related? Uh, craving, the sense of self, and uh, uh, the stages of enlightenment are all, uh, they're all linked together here. Yes. So is the arahat already lose the already uh, cease the desire to to be alive? I mean, is that true that uh, an this is arahat a, can be dead at any time that they have no desire to uh, continue their life? That's right. That's right. Yes, and it's uh, after the Buddha's enlightenment, as he tells us. Uh, he said, after his enlightenment, Mara came to him. And you have to understand, Mara is a personification of what we might describe temptation. It's Mara is not a, a being yeah. that you can point to, in fact, on the back. It's Mara is inside. Mara arose and said to Buddha, you have no reason to stay in this world anymore. So, just... Go away. Go away. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the... Uh, Brahma. <laughs> Brahma, uh, well... Yeah, Brahma played... The, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the highest Brahma Deva played a role in this because um, the Buddha said, oh, this is, this is too... This is too subtle. Nobody's ever going to understand this. There's no point in me trying to teach anybody this. And then, you know, the the, the Brahma came and said, uh, uh, oh, "Oh, blessed one, there are those with little dust in their eyes, and please, uh, please stay and please teach." Uh, anyway, so as a result of that, when Mara came and said, "You know, look, this, this, you don't have to do this anymore," <laughs> and uh, the Buddha said, oh, oh evil one, until uh, until there are bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and lay men and lay women who have understood this dharma and practiced this dharma and mastered this dharma and can teach this dharma and had, can answer the challenge of others, I will not leave this world. Uh, what this is saying to us is it answers the question, it's a question people come up with, with you know, why, why, why would a Buddha stay alive? You know, once, once you've achieved complete enlightenment, why do you get out of bed the next morning? And it is out of compassion. Um, and uh, so I can't leave you hanging there in that part of the story. I guess I have to tell you a little bit more. <laughs> so, <laughs> when the Buddha loses when the Buddha loses this last vestige of self which is the 
inherent sense of being a separately existing being. Does that mean that there is some kind of annihilation takes place of the Buddha? Annihilation? Disappear? No. What disappears is the sense of separateness. So what you can look at, one way you can look at what happens as a person follows the path of enlightenment is they start off saying, okay, this is self, and that's not self. And then they keep whittling away, saying, well, no, this is not self too, oh, that's not self too, and that's not self too, until finally there's nothing left but this last little wisp of separateness. But the nature of this whole process is, and, and you'll appreciate this, it's a boundary. Self and not self are separated by a boundary. When the last wisp disappears, there is no boundary, which means the Buddha is no longer separate from anything, from everything. So that's where the Buddha's compassion comes from. That's where a stream winner's compassion come from, comes from, is because the, in the experience of seeing things as they really are, even though their mind is still so terribly conditioned in all of these ways by craving uh, and by the, uh, the sense of self, the inherent sense of self and so forth that still remains, all the habitual patterns of action and everything else that the stream winner has. Nevertheless, the stream winner has had the experience of non-separation and realizes that the truth, the ultimate truth of non-self is that is oneness, is the absolute oneness. Okay? Another way to understand this is we are all ultimately the same. The Buddha nature is the same in all of us, and it is in every sentient being. And if you remove all of the things that make us different, what's left is the sameness, the Buddha nature, which, uh, these are my, this is my way of describing it and thinking about it. Uh, you may or may not agree or like this, but I'm talking to you about a truth that could be expressed in an incredible number of different ways. And they're all words. But pure consciousness. There is only one consciousness, ultimately. Not the dualistic consciousness of me being conscious of the, of, of the color uh, uh, of this robe when I look at it. That's dualistic consciousness. Not the consciousness of the dualistic consciousness that I am the experiencer of my sense of self. But I'm talking about behind that. Behind both your experience of blueness when you look at the sky and your experience of, uh, of heat when you touch a hot object, behind every one of your sensory experiences and your mental experiences, there is a sameness, is there not? Is there not a certain sameness that is of... Uh, the, the aspect that, for better, lack of a better word, the conscious awareness that infuses the experience of knowing. And it's the same whether it's eye consciousness or whether it's touch consciousness or whether it's mind consciousness, whether it's smell consciousness. Is, is there not, at the deepest level, something that is the same? Okay? And can you not see that in the same way that there is a sameness that is independent of the different senses in your body, there is a sameness in all of our experience. Take, for example, pain. There is a sameness in the experience 
of pain in all sentient beings. But you, you're comparing um, sentient beings to sentient beings. What about um, non-sentient beings? Like rocks? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that one yet. I suspect <laughs> that I suspect in the ultimate unity of what is that those distinctions somehow fall away as well but I don't you know I, I can't that's that's ask me a few years okay sure okay. I'll give me a year <laughs> I'll give me a year <laughs> I'm sorry I'm sorry it's terrible but uh, you know whether you whether you agree with this philosophically or not can you entertain this idea that there's an ultimate level that the consciousness in all of us is the same. It's only one. It's absolutely, it's the same consciousness. Just manifesting in different ways. And so, when I come in contact with that in myself, and then I look at each of you, I see myself. I mean, I could say that I was Elaine in another lifetime. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing myself and I have the sense of myself as Elaine or as Tracy or as Ben. Or, I mean, there is only one. Okay? Now, if I see being suffering and we are all one, uh, I have a good reason not to check out yet, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what gives rise to true compassion, the deepest compassion. Is as long as long as there is a separate sentient being in the universe that is experiencing suffering as a result of ignorance, rather than experiencing uh, the ultimate bliss of oneness. There's work to be done, right? Yeah. So. So. One, one, oh, sorry, I have. I just really like to satisfy my curiosity. I apologize. Mm-hmm. So, so if all, all condition, all conditional things are mm-hmm. impermanent, then even the people with like, you know, ten foot breaks on their eyes, they'll eventually be enlightened. Yeah. So, so we all have hope. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, right. That's right. All sentient, all, all, all living beings will be enlightened eventually. <laughs> right. but, but when you have a time, can you explain emptiness and the Buddha nature? Oh yes, I'd love to. Yes, please, that, please uh, explain that. That guarantees it will go over time. Uh, uh, another, on another occasion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we've been talking about tonight is the emptiness of self. Okay. So, uh, and the, uh, if, if, uh, if selflessness is, the, uh, is one of the most difficult uh, Dharma concepts to, to grasp, uh, right up there next to it uh, is, is emptiness. Because they're really, in a sense, they're, they're, both, they're, they're both the same thing. There's emptiness of self and there's emptiness of everything else that we experience. And it's actually a little bit easier to understand the emptiness of everything else. And the emptiness of self is is the hardest one to uh, to grasp. And as a matter of fact, you won't really grasp it until you have the experience of nirvana, and then it'll be like, ah, oh, piece of cake. <laughs> so, so would you agree that uh, enlightenment is equal to this great uh, uh, compassion yes. and uh, loving kindness, yeah. and is equal to emptiness? Uh, and, and is equal to Buddha nature. Would you agree? Um, well, uh, uh, okay, you're, you're stringing together a number of concepts which each has very specific meanings. They overlap, but to say that they're equal to... Now, that's, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Then they're, because they, they are expressing different, uh, different things. But... Um, if the Buddha nature is a state of existence rather than non-existence in which there is no separation and total compassion. Right? So in that case, Buddha nature is the same as compassion. Okay, <laughs> 
But when we take when we say when we say the word Buddha nature, it also has specific meanings that are not included in the word compassion, and vice versa. Okay. But yes, these yes, if you mean you you mean all of these are, are really intricately connected to each other. Yes, they absolutely are. They're not just sort of associated with each other on the same page. They are woven in together. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is because there's a lot of compu- confusion between Buddha nature and the emptiness. So I would, you, would you explain to us when you have time? Sure, I will. I will. Yes, I'll be happy to do that. And then and just... The one thing that confuses a lot of people is they make emptiness into a thing. And emptiness is not a thing. <laughs> so, you can say, emptiness is the nature, is the ultimate true nature of anything and everything. So, emptiness is the nature of... Uh, uh, the, the Buddha nature is, has the nature of emptiness. So, so would you agree that... Uh, Buddha nature is not a thing. It's not a thing. Buddha nature is not a thing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nothing. It's not a thing. <laughs> As a matter of fact... <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to understand. Yeah. All things exist in the mind. Then I have no problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, now I understand. Yes? Okay. Uh, two questions. Mm-hmm. One question is, uh, before I ask, uh, 我的问题, 就是刚刚的问题就是说, 金刚经里面, In the Diamond Sutra, there is this expression, um, <laughs> there is this expression, the most famous expression in the Diamond Sutra, uh, because we don't. We, we have a difficulty uh, to translate. <laughs> that, 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 that sentence is the uh uh uh. Uh, 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 Oh, okay. 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 So, so you know what it is, but you have trouble translating. I know. I have to think about it. This is a no, no more attachment, and uh, you, you gotta have the um, Buddha No, no, not, not, not exactly. I think. Okay, okay. Second question. Okay, the other question. I think the impermanent and emptiness, they are twin. Do you agree? Impermanent and And emptiness? They are twin. Twin. Twins? You you could say that, or... Yes, you could say that. From impermanence you can discover emptiness. And uh, realizing emptiness, you... The, it, there, there's no possibility of anything except impermanence. So, so. I have a question. Uh, the Abhidharma and the Yoga Chara, they are, uh, looks like they, they are presented in a very uh, philosophical way. Um, but do you think they actually come from the actual experience? That they that the Abhidharma and Yogacara come from actual experience. I, I think I think the Yogacara teachings uh, are based in actual meditation experience. They are an intellectual interpretation of meditation experience, and uh, I believe that the that the that the, there is a certain problem with the. Uh, uh, Yogacara interpretation, which is precisely pinpointed by the Madhyamaka interpretation, but that the Prasangaka, uh, the the Rangtang, uh, the two Rangtang versions of Madhyamaka, the Prasangika, and uh, also the uh, Satrantika, are flawed. 
the Shentong is what I believe is the highest and clearest interpretation, which is a Yogacara Madhyamaka. So I bet nobody understood a word of that except. <laughs> Yeah, we've been we've been studying that in my study group back in the, in San Jose. It's so thick that they translate it to Chinese. It's this big. That one. <laughs> Not much. You should learn. I have a question. The the, the diamond. Uh, no no no. The 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 yoga. Oh, the yoga chara. Yoga chara. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the yoga chara. Yes, it's very it is it's very challenging. It's very difficult to to understand. Yeah. How many books, sutras, do we need to read to get enlightened? I mean, <laughs> this is an important question. Can we do answer? Can we just know the four noble? You don't need to read any books. Yes. <laughs> read your mind. You're, you're serious, right? I'm serious. Yeah. You don't. You don't need to read any books. Uh, they didn't have books in the Buddhist day. So we have so many sutras to study these days, and some people devote yeah. more time. I, you know, that may be one of the things that keeps people from getting enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> Especially Abhidhamma and the books. But since you know all these the things... Abhidhamma, the other part of your question is whether the Abhidhamma was, whether I thought Abhidhamma was based on real... Especially the Abhidhamma Sankara, you know, there are a lot of like, uh, Explanation about different psychological mm-hmm. factors and uh, yeah. elements. Oh, it's too tedious. I hate <laughs> it. Is, it's, I hate both. It's very. It is, <laughs> it is very challenging. I mean, uh, no. I believe in the Abhidhamma. You have uh, hugely more intellectual analysis overlaying any actual. I think. I think it has as its foundation experience, but I, I think it, it's hard to. See the experience through all that overlay of intellectual analysis. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I know it's getting late. A uh, very quick question. Um, <laughs> Don't mention late. Oh, oh so, I'm sorry, it's so way too early. early. <laughs> 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 um, I'd like to focus my practice uh, primarily on, on meditation and just through observing um, the three marks in my daily life. And um, I, 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 a lot of times I, f- I find just reading is just kind of like a confirmation of what I understand. Mm-hmm. I think it's much better to to understand something firsthand rather than yeah. secondhand. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. The best, uh, I, you know, in, in my, own, my own personal path, I was presented with all sorts of texts to read by my teacher, my Dhammacharya, Jodi Dhamma. The, the Sudhimaga and sutras and uh, various Mahayana texts and you know and I just found them just so tedious but then I practice and then I have experiences in practice you know and he'd say well that's this you know go go, go to uh, this book uh, and, and this section there and so most of most of my learning originally was I go to the books to understand what I experienced and to get an idea of what to do next. You know, and that, that's a really wonderful way to do it. The trouble is that, and, and as you'll see, there's all these books on Buddhism and they're written by people who read somebody else's book first and they thought they understood what they were saying. And so they wrote another book about that, what they thought it was. <laughs> but they did... I, I, I tell you, I started out when I... Well, a few years ago, when I became... Uh, uh, when the idea first came that I would teach meditation, you know, and I thought, oh, okay, I can see that there's people that, that really would like to learn to meditate, and there's a lot of people that aren't having much luck with meditation. So I said, okay, well, I better read the books on meditation. I get these books, you know, there's something you go to Amazon.com or a bookstore, and all these books on meditation. And, oh, yeah, okay. And then this person doesn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, We're and very I, fortunate to have a wonderful teacher like you, so we don't have to go through that well, difficult process. Well, well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, and actually, that is that is the role that I want to play. I'd like yeah. to. You're extraordinarily I, I'd like to be, helpful. The benefit of my experience and the way my experience, my understanding of my own experience has been enormously enhanced 
by reading and study. You know, and as I say, you have an experience, and then if you go to a good source and you read, you know, and you understand it. But unfortunately, there's a lot of books out there written by people who only have, uh, they don't have the practice experience. They haven't done the things, and they're writing about things that they think they understand what it, it means, you know. And it's very confusing, and it would be very frustrating. Very frustrating. It's very wonderful that you're filtering all, you know, spending all that time filtering out all the best stuff and telling us all the best stuff. <laughs> I, 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 although the other thing I want to tell you, though, is that there are many, uh, there, there are many different methods and many different interpretations. And one of the things that uh, I have noticed is that, uh, uh, to a greater or lesser degree, a lot of them seem to work. So, you know, uh, what I teach you is absolutely not the only way. And there's other teachers whose way, ways uh, also work. But what I'll teach you is what I know and from my experience. My experience, my understanding that comes primarily from my experience and, and my, what, what I have been able to enhance that with through reading and study. But please, I'm not saying that I have no the only way, because there are other ways. Do you have a list of books that you 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 like personally that you could recommend for us to read? Uh, I've been thinking. I mean, I've had a number of people request that, and I'm going to make up a list of books. You know the way it is is that if if I were to take and make a list of, say, what I think are the ten best books, there's still, about each of those, something I like better about one book than the other, and something I don't like about each book, and so forth. And that's what makes it difficult, because, uh, well, maybe I should put it, if I take the hundred books that I have gotten something from, how do I pick the ten? Because, you know, I mean, there's no one book that I'd say, boy, this is, this, this is the one, forget the rest. <laughs> Can, can you write a book yourself? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the teacher is in the process. Yeah, he's, he's writing his own book. Oh, that's wonderful. So we just read your book. Yeah. So we can save all the time and get enlightened this life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we like sure De Definitely do that. De definitely get enlightened in this life. I yeah. want to. I really want to. Okay. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. So it's uh, it's pretty well Double. time for bed. I I, I I think you know I cheated you of your evening meditation. Yes. Please go say if you want. To. <laughs> I just want to actually uh, raise the question. Uh, raise twice up here again. Uh, the sentence I tried to translate. It's a a, a verse in Diamond Sutra mm -hmm. and associated with the Hui Nan story. No, no, no. He, she doesn't want to be in that. The 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 translation is by not dwelling anything. Dwell is living or stay. Dwelling anything. The Qing uh, Chinese translation literally means heart arises. How do, how do I understand? Okay, I I had trouble understanding <laughs> what you said there. Um, by not stay. No. A dwelling. By not dwelling. By not dwelling. Dwelling mm -hmm. anything and uh, seeing the heart. And so mind, 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 heart, mind. Mind arises. By by not dwelling anything. on anything, uh -huh. the heart arises. Yeah, the story associated with this one is the uh, sixth picture of Curtis Burst, and he uh, he liked it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I like it. It sounds. Uh, it's, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I think I've uh, I've heard it before. I'll tell you how I would understand this: that dwelling on anything is the mind creating reality, and that's our whole problem. Our mind keeps creating reality, and because of that, we can't see. Uh, we can't see the ultimate nature of things because it's obscured. So, by and, and that is the nature of 
the enlightenment experience. I mean, when you come to that experience of having, uh, what what happens is the mind stops. The mind stops its doing. The mind stops its uh, its uh, clinging and craving and clinging. And once it stops, then uh, what was the last part of the phrase? The heart or the heart mind. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to translate in Chinese, but something arises. Is that mm-hmm. compassion, as you mentioned? Mm-hmm. Compassion. Yeah. It's very difficult to translate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's how hearing it now, what comes to my mind, the way I relate to that, is it's describing that when you are able to to, to stop the constant process of, of, of generation of dualistic reality by, uh, by the mind, then you see the true nature of things. You understand the emptiness of things and the experience of nirvana. <laughs> right. I got the message. <laughs> He's very compassionate. Does it ever do this any other time? Just keep no. going. No. Usually just it's testing you. <laughs> Never. <laughs> he has great compassion towards you. Yeah. <laughs> I think this thing has a mind of its own. Something else we got another teacher to rest. It's a sign from the head. Okay. Just one teacher to rest. Okay. So yeah. I say yeah. great compassion. Right. Well, thank you very much, and I'm going to depart, and please consider if you would like to stay here and meditate, that would be great, but otherwise, I'll see you in the morning.